Hello, my name is Daryl Phillips and I'm the volunteer host for this session and I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of Humanities Tennessee to the Southern Festival of Books. If you're watching on Facebook Live or YouTube and you want to ask questions during the session, feel free to do so. Parnassus Books here in Nashville is our bookseller for the Southern Festival of Books and your purchases of these books via Parnassus help to keep the festival free. Humanities Tennessee staff should have placed a book buy link for this session at the top of the chat. The festival is a free nonprofit event that is supported in part by donations from individuals. If you appreciate the event and want to support it, you can do so via the app or by visiting the website at www.humtn.org. Now I'd like to welcome Vernon Burton and Armin Durfner, authors of Justice Deferred, and Joshua Rothman, the author of The Legend and the Chain. Uh, let's start with, uh, with Joshua, if you want to tell us a little bit about your book, and then we'll have some discussion and some questions after that. Sure. Uh, thanks, Daryl. Um, I want to hope Joshua. Well, hopefully we provide as much time as possible for uh, for our conversation for questions. So I'll just try to give you a Yeah. Okay. I, I, you, had, you had phased out on me. Go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. I can hear you now. Okay, good. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just want to give a, a very brief overview of the book and, and talk about sort of why it matters. And, and um, hopefully we'll have lots of time for, for conversation and questions. Um, the, the Ledger in the Chain traces the, uh, the lives and careers of Isaac Franklin, John Armfield, and Rice Ballard, who were the most important domestic slave traders in American history. Um, by the domestic slave trade, I'm referring to the buying and selling of enslaved people within the boundaries of the United States. And the domestic trade was something that actually predates the United States itself. But it really took off in the 19th century as the nation expanded into what was then the Southwest, as white farmers flocked there to capitalize on Indian dispossession and the growth of the cotton economy, and as the federal ban on the transatlantic slave trade took hold beginning in 1808, leaving farmers who wanted enslaved laborers no choice but to acquire them domestically. The slave traders fed this demand, and no one played a bigger role in the slave trade industry than the men at the center of my book. Now, through their company, which was commonly known as Franklin and Armfield, they trafficked roughly 10,000 enslaved people from the Upper South, particularly from Maryland and Virginia, to the Lower South, particularly Louisiana and Mississippi. Now, they did it very quickly. Uh, the company was founded in 1828. It effectively stopped dealing in human beings in 1836. And yet, in that short period of time, Franklin, Armfield, and Ballard transformed the domestic trade from something white men might do on the short term for extra money into a profession, into a big business that could yield tremendous wealth for its operators. And in doing that, they established a business model for the slave trade that other traders would follow and build upon for decades. Um, but their impact obviously goes beyond the slave trade business. Uh, by selling the labor, the bodies, the asset values of enslaved people, they made possible the expansion of the cotton and sugar economies. Uh, and the cotton economy in particular sat at the heart not just of Southern economic growth, but of American economic growth before the Civil War. And the capital that was extracted from the enslaved as they were bought and trafficked and sold and forced to labor, all of that then circulated throughout the entire country and ultimately across the Atlantic Ocean as well. And of course, slave traders and the slave trade ravaged the families and the communities of the enslaved people who fell victim to it. And the numbers of those people were enormous. Uh, between 1800 and 1860, roughly 1 million enslaved people were forcibly migrated across state lines. At least twice as many were bought and sold within individual states. Altogether, an enslaved person was sold somewhere in the United States roughly every three and a half minutes for decades. Um, and so the book uses the stories of Franklin, Armfield, and Ballard to trace the broader ebbs and flows of that domestic trade over time, watching it grow and expand in the early 19th century 
stagger under the blows of financial disruption, and then rise again out of the depression, only to become nearly as big as it had ever been by the outbreak of the Civil War that finally brought it to an end. So the book covers a lot of the history of slavery, the slave trade, its relationship to the American economy. Um, it tells a story of several men in particular and their business that were central to that history. Um, and it, it's a hard history to deal with. But I think among the hardest things that the book demonstrates is that neither the slave trade nor slave traders ever really suffered for the criticism they faced from the small number of American anti-slavery activists. In fact, quite the opposite. They flourished both socially and economically. Um, and I think we, we have ideas sometimes to the contrary, um, but those ideas really are mostly myths. Um, and the fact that they are myths, the fact that the slave trade was a ubiquitous, profitable, widely accepted element of American life before the Civil War, the fact that slave traders could be understood as respectable businessmen, vital to American development, um, that says some, I think, some deeply uncomfortable things about the history of the United States. But I think they're things that we need to face squarely and learn how to grapple with. Um, and I hope that the book contributes to that, uh, that part of the conversation. Uh, Vernon, Armin, I'll let you uh, describe a little bit about your book. Take it away. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, we're very excited about justice deferred race in the Supreme Court. It's really a unique way to look at race, which we know is is actually genetically no such thing, of course, but has legal constructs and implications. And so we use the Supreme Court as a lens to look at race before there's United States right into, in fact, the confirmation of Amy Comey Barrett to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's, it's really interesting because there's not been a book written like this before. And I think the reason is, I don't believe any historian could have written it, at least any that I know. And I'm not sure and do not believe that probably a legal scholar could because it is a history by an attorney a, a, uh, a civil rights attorney and a legal scholar and a historian, and we've tried to combine those voices. Uh, the, the Virginia judge, in fact, who convicted Richard and Mildred Love of unlawful, they used the word miscegnation, said, Almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. He therefore ruled that God, quote, did not intend for the races to mix. Well, the Supreme Court has dealt with issues involving all these groups of people that some people would call racist, and so does Justice Deferred. From the 17th century through 2021, we cover slavery as aftermath, reconstruction, Jim Crow, the dismantling of Jim Crow, modern day problems, including criminal justice, voting rights, and affirmative action. Armin, you want to pick up there? Yeah, the Supreme Court, we, we tend to think, or at least people of my age group tend to think of the Supreme Court as the protector of liberty. Uh, it was the court that ended segregation, protected protect the right to vote, uh, free speech, fair trials, and so forth. But it turns out, as we look at it, that uh, that image of the Supreme Court really uh, dates from a very short period, from about the 1930s to the early 1970s. And before that time, before the 1930s, the Supreme Court was really, had really just a god-awful record on race, uh, helped uh, promote Jim Crow and, and support the worst excesses of, uh, of Jim Crow, uh, even after the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments that was supposed to end slavery and uh, create equal rights, etc. And since the 1970s, the court has been moving backward. And frankly, in the last decade, uh, the court has been going rapidly, rapidly backward. Um, and I think we think both very much out of keeping with where the rest of the nation wants to go. So the Supreme Court's record is one that we've looked at at the same time as looking at how the nation has gone back and forth on the question of race. Thank you. 
You know, one thing that uh, I guess this would probably go to uh, either Vernon or Armand. Uh, one of the things in the book that uh, struck me was talking about affirmative action. And I think in the book you mentioned that uh, President Kennedy was the first one to call it affirmative action. But affirmative action has been going on forever. It was just affirmative action toward white males only for a long period of time. Could you speak about that? And, uh, um, and you know, I, I never really heard it explained that way. And uh, so... Uh, well, we've talked, okay, we've talked since about the 1970s. There's been a lot of talk the last 40 or more years about whether affirmative action is right or constitutional or effective or moral, etc. cetera. Uh, as you say, uh, affirmative action in favor of African-Americans or uh, other racial minorities. But in fact, the 40 years before that saw the greatest affirmative action program in the history of the world for white people. So it was one in which uh, the nation uh, was in a huge housing boom the federal government poured tens of billions and billions of dollars into suburbs that were basically white suburbs. And in fact, the uh, federal government had rules uh, that promoted segregation in the new housing areas. Uh, the federal government also passed laws, and these were laws that were well intended uh, because they were social security, and minimum wage, and unemployment insurance. Uh, they were certainly well intended uh, but they basically favored whites and left blacks out. All these laws, they covered, for example, Social Security, minimum wage, etc. They covered two-thirds or almost all white employees, and they left out of the coverage almost all black employees. So uh, it was in those years that uh, the nation, with the help of the federal government, created a middle class, but it was a middle class of white people. So we're not talking about whether affirmative action today is, quote, right or wrong or whatever, but you can't talk about it without the background that says it comes on the heels of a gigantic affirmative action program for white people. So what is the answer today, not just in today's lens, but looking at the whole picture? Uh, Vernon, your mic's not. Uh, your mic's on now. Okay, thank you. Uh, one of the most interesting things is these laws, which are neutral in the way they are written in terms of race, of course. There's a very strong Southern block of congressmen who make sure that domestic workers, farm workers are excluded. And these are primarily African Americans in the South. And it goes on and on and on. And, what a lot of people don't realize, I think, because it was slavery ended and, uh, you know, what is going on about affirmative action is it's affirmative action whites, even things like the GI Bill, whereas a white veteran such as my uh, father-in-law could use a veteran bill to buy a home in a neighborhood which would increase in value and therefore allow him to use that equity to send his children to college for a, an African-American redlining, which was government rules and state rules, would not allow them to buy in areas where that kind of equity would increase. Or even a veterans bill like going to college, going back on the GI Bill, which is a great thing. But if you're in Alabama or South Carolina, you can't go to the University of South Carolina, University of Alabama, or even University of Tennessee, because you have to go to historically black colleges. And I love historically black colleges. They've done amazing things. But the networks, the, the, the sort of resources that are available there are very different. So you get the idea of how you keep compiling on and on to this legacy of discrimination, even when it seems to be a neutral and a good program that continues to build a, a large gap between the wealth accumulation uh, African Americans and some other minorities as well over time. Uh, Joshua, uh, this question is for you. In, in your book,
you were talking about how uh, sort of how integrated into proper society these slave traders were and one of them having a probably more than one of them having a really nice home in a nice neighborhood but in the court garden behind the house he had uh, cages and he would whenever he would transport them and get ready to make a shipment he would march them out usually at night so his neighbors didn't see it they were very aware of it they knew that it was there but you know the ones that, uh, that maybe had some qualms about it were very happy to ignore that and I think that it has some parameters in looking at the Supreme Court also could you talk a little bit about that about how society supported it both overtly and just by ignoring it yeah I mean I, I think that's right I think by and large it is um, both sort of condoned and ignored right um, uh, slaveholders in most parts of the country um, particularly in the lower south but in the upper south as well people in the upper south have an interest in in sales more, more than purchases people in the lower south have an interest in purchases more than sales um, and and those are something that sort of holds the region together in that way and simply the the, the profitability of slave sales is something that leads most white people to for whatever their qualms might be about the slave trade they're never really in a position where they're going to say this isn't something we should do anymore um now there were things about the slave trade that made even white southerners uncomfortable um but most of those things had to do with sort of the 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 appearance of it right they didn't like having to look at enslaved people in chains they worried that enslaved people who were kept in pens and cages could potentially um, spread disease. Um, they found it unsightly to look at these things, right? Which is why a lot of places uh, um, passed regulations after a while that insisted that the slave trade had to be kept behind walls, right? That you couldn't have sort of open air uh, um, or, or, or pens that people could see from the street. You couldn't traipse enslaved people up and down the street or keep them on display. Um, but the slave trade was also something that was so integral to making slavery work that there's never really any momentum that builds to do anything substantive about it. Uh, the only really kind of consistent opposition to the domestic slave trade anywhere in the United States comes from anti-slavery activists. And I think we all know from the history of the United States that they are um, a relatively small, if very vocal, uh, minority of white people. So, um, so bo both both economically and culturally there are reasons why the slave trade carries out for as long as it does vernon uh i'll ask you this question um you know i was uh it was interesting reading about uh, thurgood marshall coming onto the court and i think there was something that he uh, some quote about he won a lot more civil rights cases before he got on the Supreme Court. And uh, it's a comparison about uh, Clarence Thomas and Sonia Sotomayor, you know, having some similarities coming up. Um, what do you see as, uh, you know, and there's been a, quite the, you know, a lot more diversity on the court, both women and, and minorities. Uh, what do you see as good things about that and and do you see any things that it hasn't really brought the promise has fulfilled some of the promises of that yes and, and thurgood marshall is just amazing he won uh cases that was unbelievable arguing you know often uh, the, the the groveland the the case we discuss in florida where, you know, he's threatened to be lynched and things. He's able to win cases before the Supreme Court. It's just amazing. He gets on the Supreme Court, and then he's on the losing side on most of the decisions as the court changes. And there's one scene we have in our book that I really like because it expresses something that we try to argue in the book, that there are three branches of government. 
Uh, and in, in this case, the Supreme Court is one. And, you know, initially the founders had ways that these would balance each other, checks and balances. But when Thurgood Marshall came up both for his federal appointment and then for the Supreme Court, um, uh, Strom Thurmond of South Carolina was on Judiciary Committee and he just gave him a heck of a time, you know, are you a communist? It was, it was a terrible grilling. If you go back and read uh, those transcripts. And then it's 1980, which we discuss in the book. And his dear friend, William Brennan, great justice, comes up to Thurgood Marshall. And he says, is it true? Is it true with the Reagan revolution that Ted Kennedy, who had been a champion of civil rights, is no longer chair of the Judiciary Committee? And it is Strom Thurmond. And you have to sort of envision these two men. Thurgood Marshall was a bear of a man, a giant. William Brennan is a small, frail little man. And they're in their robes. Thurgood Marshall puts his arm around Brennan and they march back to their chambers. To me, it's symbolic of these two great warriors for racial and social and justice itself going off to their last battle. It's also symbolic, I think, the questions you ask, how important politics is in the courts and the court appointment. We are not a parliamentarian form of government. We have a presidency that is winner take all with incredible consequences that help lead to a civil war and also leads to the justices we have, both at the Supreme Court and in fact, at the uh, federal level. And those are lifetime appointments. As we said, you know, Thurgood Marshall had said that he would not resign from the court. He expected to be at age 100, uh, killed by a jealous husband. Um, and instead, uh, at the time when he was very ill, he is, Good friend William Brennan uh, had already left the court, and it looked like at the time that he went ahead and submitted his resignation that there was no way that George Bush, the first Bush president, would not be reelected. I mean, he had invaded Iraq. His approval ratings were at 80. No one saw a Ross Perot coming into the election or Bill Clinton winning. And here's the irony, and what a difference the vote makes. If he had not resigned, he lived long enough to Bill Clinton's inauguration. Bill Clinton would have had that appointment. And so how would the Supreme Court, which interceded and decided the election for the second George Bush versus uh, Al Gore, what a difference that would have even made. So you can see the consequences of politics in our government and the importance of the vote and how that reflects down on all of these appointments. It was Clarence Thomas who was then appointed to replace Thurgood Marshall. Most people think it would have been Judge Higginbotham, another great advocate of civil rights and justice and those sorts of things. Well, I can run on and on on that, but Armin might want to speak to this as well. I just want to remind the great audience that we've got, feel free to post any questions that you have in uh, which, what, on Facebook or on YouTube, whatever you're watching on, and we'd be happy to get to those. Uh, and this is, I, I, I'm going to start this out as a little bit of an observation from, uh, from uh, Justice Deferred, but when uh, my brother has been a volunteer on host before, and I was telling him that I was hosting this session and, and he's an attorney and I said I'd gotten this book and I said I feel like I should just give this to you and you give me a book re report on it. But one of the things that uh, for both of the books is uh, it it's a book about the Supreme Court by great legal minds but I'm not a great legal mind but it was a good read uh, it you know it didn't it made sense to me it was almost like a you could read it as a collection of short stories reading about the the um, the cases and that sort of thing so I want to 
I want to start with Armin and about how you as a writer uh, write with your audience in mind and then after Armin, Joshua and then Vernon. Thank you. That, that's an important observation because frankly that when people tell us they like the book for this or that, the thing I'm always listening to is was it something that they enjoyed reading? And that universally they say so. It makes me feel terrific. Uh, I've always worked hard at writing not like a lawyer is supposed to write, but writing for my audience. And the audience here, in our view, is the general reader. And we both work real hard to keep jargon out, to explain things, to make it interesting. Just like you said, a bunch of short stories. And I'll give credit to our wives, Vernon's wife especially, and my wife. They both, every time we showed them something, they insisted that we write in the English language. And I would write something, for example, that I thought, well, it's pretty clear. And George Ann Burton or Mary Giles, my wife, would say, well, it's not clear to me. And so we, we all worked hard and we had lots of help in making sure that this book was the kind of book that you, your brother, and your friends would enjoy reading. I've given given the topic uh, of my book. I think it's very rare for somebody to tell me that they enjoyed reading it. Right. Uh, the subject matter is, as I said before, it's a very difficult one. It was a hard one to write. It was a hard one to research and spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, but but in terms of writing it, I I thought and still think it's a story that is important enough that. I wanted to be sure that anyone could read this. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that the language was very accessible. Uh, I want to try to make it um, as much, you know, history is often something that sort of falls between being an art and a science, right? Some universities, it's in the humanities section, some universities it's in the social science section. And it sort of, so it has that kind of weird in betweenness to it as a, as a discipline. And I think history writing as a genre often falls uh, uh, to, to one side or the other. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, I think it would be a little pretentious to say that I fashion my own writing as being artistic in any way, but I do think that history potentially when it's done well has great value as literature. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the, the, the frame of mind that I bring to, to writing when I can, particularly if I know it's going to be for a general audience. Oh, okay. I think most things have been said, but I agree completely. And we try to tell the stories of people, some well-known like Thurgood Marshall, some like Ms. Mary Hamilton, who was a civil rights worker who went to jail because she refused to answer to the term Mary. And ironically, the Supreme Court understood the importance of being called Ms. Mary Hamilton and took a very small, in terms of a fine case, to the Supreme Court, understanding what that meant in the South, uh, the designation that people have. But it really is about people. And to go along with what Josh said, uh, a lot of people ask us when they read this story, well, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Because one of the things we talk about is, given that a generation is 25 years, when you think about this history of race and the Supreme Court, we have had 12 generations where the legal system and the Supreme Court in particular almost always passed or supported laws and a legal system that not only justified and had slavery as legal, but white privilege, Jim Crow, all of those things. And we've only had two generations where we started at least to become aware of those and move from them. And then in some areas now, such as we discussed earlier, affirmative action, but perhaps even more important in voting and other issues with the Supreme Court, we seem to be going back to another period in which federalism had something of a different meaning, but in terms of undermining laws in a democracy. So we wanted to make sure that these were stories of people and how the laws affected people's lives. 
Uh, here's a from anyone on the panel uh, in a time of what feels like intimidation from some of our political bodies and laws now passed regarding teaching US history and CRT what advice would you give our US history teachers and particularly middle and high school history teachers and how do they navigate these times and laws in the classroom do you I, I will just say that you know there's a whole saying the truth sets you free and that's what we're doing and I don't understand uh, when people talk about critical race theory at all don't you want to understand how events and laws have affected the long-term range what I talked about earlier uh, the GI Bill uh, Social Security that's not critical race theory though some might say it. that's just looking at the effect that laws had in affecting differentials and people who if you want to define it as race but black white mexican american native american are different but i think we i cannot imagine anyone not wanting to know the truth uh so i i don't under understand and i honestly believe those people doing public education those school teachers are doing god's work and they need our help and our support in every way possible at this time I, I agree with that. There was a some years ago, there was a book, a new history book of Mississippi published, which was very not much like the old history books that kids learned in, in high school of happy slaves, etc. And this book was rejected by the state textbook board. So there was a lawsuit about it. And when they asked the textbook commissioner why had they rejected the book, he said, Well, you know, it's got a lot of upsetting things in there, like it has a picture of a lynching. And the lawyer said, well, but didn't that actually happen? And the textbook uh, official said, yeah, but it was so long ago. And the judge, the wonderful judge then, put it in a nutshell, because he asked the textbook, then said, well, isn't this a history book? I think that's, I'll go along with Bernard. I'm sure Professor Rothman thinks the same thing. We need the history teachers to keep us straight. And straight is inquiring for the truth. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I absolutely agree with, with both Vernon and Armin on this. But, you know, in terms of advice for uh, middle and high school teachers, um, I mean, the best advice and really the only advice I, I feel like I can give at this moment is um, is be brave. <laughs> um, because, you know, the, 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 how do they navigate these sorts of laws in the classroom? You know, the, the, the laws, I think that the, the general tendency of all of them is to stifle conversation about any of these issues and to really to stifle even any attempt to relay this sort of information. Um, you know, if you're, you're asking for, for laws that are trying to keep students from feeling uncomfortable, um, I mean, you know, talking about things like the slave trade, there's no way to talk about that and feel comfortable with it. And if it is, if you are, then you're doing it wrong. Um, but, you know, how that plays out, I think on the ground is a lot different than what happens in a legislature. And the way this is gonna play out, it's gonna be different state to state, district to district. It's gonna be different school to school and maybe even classroom to classroom. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think there's any there's any way that somebody in my position can really, um, you know, give advice to middle and high school teachers that's going to be effective to all of them across the board. I think they're going to know their individual situations far better than I can. Um, and I think there are going to be situations where they're going to have to be um, they're going to have to take chances and they're going to have to be courageous in the in the kinds of things that they're willing to relate to their students. And. I, I, it, it, it pains me that we're in a, a position where teachers have to be courageous simply to teach about things like the history of slavery or the history of segregation in this country. They're, they're, they're very real. They have very long lasting impacts that we're still dealing with. They're things that they're, their students, frankly, if they don't understand those histories are gonna be ill served when they get out into the world. Um, but, but, but that's where we are. And really all I can say is, is um, you know, uh, uh, have courage, um, be prepared for blowback and um, uh, 
you have to decide what what's really worth it to you to 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 get across to your students, even if that is going to re result in some pressure being put on you in exchange. Uh, I, I want to add very, very, very quickly, Daryl, if I can. Uh, right before COVID, I did a workshop here at uh, Clemson called Lincoln's Unfinished Work. And at the end of the conference, I did a workshop all day for public school teachers in South Carolina about how to teach about race. This is before we heard any criticism of critical race theory, or anything else, because it is a difficult thing to teach with. But of course, as you're preparing people to deal in a transnational multicultural world, we want to understand why different groups of people feel differently about how events happen. And one of the things that I always recommend for school teachers is to use primary sources. You know, which do you want to accept? What people in South Carolina or Alabama said the reason they went to the Civil War after they had lost this horrible Civil War at a great cost and people had died. And they, or do you want to look at the documents when they left the Union and screamed at the top of their voices, we're leaving because we want to protect slavery and we don't think Abraham Lincoln will protect it. And let the primary documents themselves do the teaching. That is not an interpretation, but let the students look at those. And I, I think that works pretty well, whether you're at the college level or for that matter, graduate level and even at elementary level. And I've always used historiography, even with fourth graders about how historians can come to different interpretations. But uh, despite the recent uh, belief in alternative facts, as John Adams, our second president, assured us, facts are important and they are real. And so let's look and see what people said and then interpret from that. OK, great answers. And I actually pretty much answered the next question that's uh, on here. Uh, but just to give you a chance maybe to expand on this, uh, this question was specifically for uh, Dr. Rothman. Uh, what do you think is the best way for local historians and educators to reveal the difficult stories your book tells? And I know you've touched on that, but is there anything on that that you would add? Uh, yeah, I would actually. I mean, I, I think that, that, you know, Local historians probably have, you know, similar kinds of political pressures, but but I think more leeway uh, uh, to to get these stories across. And I, I guess what I'd recommend for local historians and for educators as well is, you know, look the 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 story of the domestic slave trade is um, it's it's a it's a brutal one. It involves a lot of violence. Um, it involves a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, um, all all for profit. Right. Um, it, it doesn't say particularly flattering things about how um, how the country operated or about the the positions of, of African-Americans in this country under slavery. But I do think that that one way to get that story across without it seeming this sort of unrelenting parade of horrors um, is to take a look at uh, uh, and try to examine the story from the perspective of enslaved people themselves. Right. There's. There's a lot of pain there um, and a lot of trauma there. But one thing that that over and over again in writing this book consistently uh, amazed me and continues to amaze me um, is that despite everything that enslaved people were forced to go through um, by by white slaveholders, by 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 the by the federal government and by state governments, um, they survived. Uh, they fought in whatever way that they could. Um, they came out the other side of slavery uh, with almost no resources and yet were ready to, to rebuild lives. Um, and I think focusing on those perspectives, not simply on what happened to people, but what did people do in response to what happened to them? I think that's a way to get at both the, the, the terrors of the slave trade, but also the ways in which the people who were subjected to it uh, refuse to let it entirely define them. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a useful way, I think, for, for, for audiences to, to relate to this without it feeling like it's just um, nothing, but, nothing but sorrow, because I think it's easy to fall into that story. This is a kind of a question for, uh, that goes toward bo both books, but uh, one of the things I was struck with was about thinking about uh, your book, Dr. 
Rothman was uh, the ban on transatlantic slave trade and about how that you know was good intentions but it swapped one set of horrors for another set of horrors and that it became you know you know you know a breeding sort of a thing and um, could you speak a little bit about that and about any other um, and for for Vernon uh, any thing that you could think about as far as the Supreme Court that may have been a, a turning point that was uh, filled with unintended consequences now I'll let you start first Joshua Sure. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, we we all know that the that the the federal government, Congress, bans the transatlantic slave trade in 1808. Uh, pretty much from the moment the Constitution was ratified, everyone probably knew that that was probably going to happen. But what the federal government never does is it never puts any uh, real restrictions at all on the domestic trade. In fact, if anything, what banning the transatlantic trade does. Um, you know, at, at the same time they ban the transatlantic trade, they create a set of regulations under which the domestic trade would then have to operate, right? They create customs regulations. You had to create a manifest of enslaved people, things like that. And so basically what they do is, sure, they ban the transatlantic trade, but the federal government effectually sanctions the domestic trade. It gives it a protected market, right? Domestic trader, domestic slave traders have no competition except with each other. Um, and that's a, that's a that's a protected market from the federal government. Um, there's really almost no federal legislation at all that ever restricts the domestic trade. The only one that ever comes into play is the ban on the slave trade in Washington, D.C., which doesn't happen until 1850. Um, the Supreme Court basically sidesteps the slave trade whenever it can. They have one they basically have one real case where they have an opportunity to do something about the domestic trade which frankly falls with clearly within Congress's powers of interstate commerce, right? They could have done something. Um, Congress never does something. The Supreme Court basically punts the issue down the road. Um, and so, you know, I think one way of thinking about it is unintended consequences, but I think that the consequences may have been unintended, but they're very clear. Um, it's not a secret and it becomes obvious very fast what's happening and yet the government decides to do nothing about it. So it's, I would, it, it may be unintended consequences, but it's not unintended consequences for which there was no solution. The no solution was a choice. I'll just add to that. Uh, the Supreme Court, just as Professor Rothman says, in two years, the Supreme Court in 1841, in the famous case of the Amistad, which we've all seen the movie of, uh, spoke out vigorously for freedom. Uh, and freed the Africans uh, who were uh, who were captured on that ship. The very next year, in a couple of cases, the Supreme Court was just as strong in speaking up to defend domestic slavery, to defend the fugitive slave clause, and to say it was not going to do anything to restrict the domestic slave trade. So here you have two cases in two years, both happened to be written by the same justice, Joseph Story of Massachusetts, and it shows exactly what the Professor Rothman is saying. Uh, the court took one good step, but overmatched it by a, a far worse step in the other direction. And to follow up on, on these very um, kind of issues of unintended consequences, almost every Supreme Court case had unintended consequences, none perhaps more so than uh, Dred Scott, one of the most rivaled, I think we said it may be one of the most, uh, you know, denounced case, uh, along with Plessy v. Ferguson, some others, or Brown v. Boyd. But uh, President Buchanan and Roger Toney actually thought that with the Dred Scott decision, they could avoid the Civil War. Instead, it set us on to really a path for it. And it reminds me, as a historian, as we look across time, early in the Dred Scott decision, when they could have chosen to have freed uh, Dred Scott, uh, and there had been cases that were the precedent for that, one of the justices said in the lower court, times are not as they were. And then when Judge Roberts was basically gutting the Voting Rights Act with uh, uh, the Shelby v. Holder case in 2013, 
He says almost exactly the same thing in a case for the president before that and there, and then just recently in a case that we predicted, and we're not good, a certain historian shouldn't do predicting, but predicting the Bronovich case out of Arizona, Judge Alito said that today is not as it was in 1982 with the renewal of the Voting Rights Act at that time. So as a historian, I'm fascinated that over the centuries, we hear the same sort of excuses that set up these cases, whether the uh, results are intentional or unintentional, have devastating effects upon minorities. Well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, this great discussion, and I've enjoyed your books. And I want to thank you, the authors, for participating in the Southern Festival book. And I want to thank everybody for attending. And I want to remind people, don't forget that the book purchase links for the session are posted in the chat. It's good for books, and it's good because they're good books. It's also a supporting a good, a good cause. And again, I appreciate what a, it was a very informative discussion as a historian and as a citizen. You know, I think both of these books uh, are valuable in learning about uh, being a better citizen and learning the history of our country. So with that, I will close it out. And again, thank you. Thank you. Thank Darryl. you. Really.